Can I call you friends? Is that okay for the next 15, 16 minutes? Is that all right? We're going to need a little more than that for everyone that follows. Is it okay if I call you friends for a little while? Is that okay? Great. So I've chosen to break some of the TED rules right out of the gate, uh, to use a stand for my notes, to speak very carefully, uh, because sometimes, and tonight is one of those times where the prose is more important than the polish. There's some things I want to share, uh, specifically an idea I believe is worth sharing, and I appreciate your understanding of that. This community, like so many others, is here because of the many generations of women and men who have contributed their hopes and dreams to a shared sense of history that brings us to this moment, to this time tonight. Our inheritance is the life and liveliness of this place. It's the passion. It's the energy. It's important to recognize that some of us, not all of us, in this room, not many of us, came from ancestors who were brought here against their will. Some of us were drawn to take the risk of leaving a distant home in hopes of a better future for themselves and their families. And others have lived here since the beginning of time. Since I believe the foundations of community are acknowledgement, trust, and a mutual respect across barriers of heritage, belief, and difference, I want to start with a little acknowledgement, if you will. I would like to acknowledge that this event is being held on the traditional ancestral lands of the Osheti, Shakoan people, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land and the communities of people that have called it home throughout the generations. Earlier this year, a group of creatives from the region challenged me to answer a question that I thought was very simple. If I only had 100 days to change the world, where would I begin? Where would we begin? Now, I ask myself a lot of questions. I'm a curious guy with a lot of questions, but this was the one asked of me. It was one I asked over and over and over again. And over that course of 100 days, I traveled far and wide. I visited New York, Chicago, D.C., Kansas City, L.A., Charlotte, and beyond. I was on buses, planes, trains, automobiles, and a rowing machine. Though if we're in a confessional mood, a lot less time on the rowing machine than on the airplanes. I met with some extraordinary people, truly extraordinary people that the world calls designers. These are the bridge builders and problem solvers that have quite literally named and created everything around us except for the land we stand on. The people I've met have designed brands for the world's biggest companies. They've created systems as elegant as Nike Plus and named things as simple as the Kindle. They've made the world more organized, more streamlined, and more beautiful. And I'd planned to talk about those real high line, those headline designers tonight, uh, but the universe has put, a, put me on a slightly different path. In the midst of this travel and all of this question asking, asking, I was knocked down by the story of a boy who I'll never meet. And the lessons I've learned through him and his community is what I want to share with you tonight. It was 43 days into that 100-day journey that I'd visit a neighborhood, a neighborhood that the taxi driver didn't want me to go to, or maybe he thought I was mistaken or that it was a mistake that I would visit there. Either way, he asked me twice just to make sure. He'd grown up on the south side of D.C., just to make sure that's where I wanted to go. My work was taking me there to drink cocoa and play chess in a fifth grade tournament designed for their community, but it was also a neighborhood where the night before, a 15-year-old named Gerald, Gerald Watson was shot 16 times. Or to be quite honest, he might have been a 16-year-old shot 15 times. Sometimes the details don't matter, but the people always do. Right? So if you're taking notes, if you're looking for wisdom tonight, the people always matter. My work is a funny thing. I call myself creative counsel. Uh, what does that mean, Hugh? Uh, when I said it out loud the first time a number of months ago, I said, I support creatives and creative organizations who want to thrive personally and professionally, which my dad would very quickly say, I have no idea what that means. Right? What it means to me in the most basic sense is I connect the dots. Right? In a region that values a forced version of humility, it's not, not going to necessarily be received well, but I can say with all certainty that across the face of the earth, there are very few other people that connect the dots as well as I do, between people, places, ideas. And the first lesson of dot connecting is you need to be able to see the dots. To connect the dots, you need to see the dots. Now, how many of you have heard that we're the average of the five people, our five closest friends? Has anyone heard that? A lot of you, a handful of you, all right, it's not true. I don't believe that. <laughs> we're not the average of anything or anyone. We are, however, deeply influenced by the people we're most connected to. I call these living, breathing groups of people and relationships ROI networks, relationships of influence. Oddly enough, the phrase came from a DC teacher who I met on a bus in Switzerland, but that is a different talk altogether. 
He was a man who taught Gerald Watson's classmates, neighbors, his friends. They call him Mr. P. Now, last year, I was invited to Mr. P's classroom at the creative school and met another young king a couple years younger than Gerald. They use words like the creative school and kings because they believe, as Dr. Maya Angelou does, that words are things. I'm convinced, she said, someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they get in our walls, they get in our rugs, in the upholstery, in your clothes, and finally they get into you. And these young men at the creative school who carry the generational and cultural baggage of hearing such hateful words, hearing such hateful words and being called such horrible things, need to hear beautiful words creative words, royal words, and have those stick to their clothes and to their walls and to their hearts. They call them kings because when you identify as royalty, you expect to be treated as royalty. And when you call yourself a king, you are expected to act the same way. Now, I'm not supposed to have favorites, but this one, this young king, his name is Zakari. He's special. Zakari's just like you, and yet he's like nobody you've ever met. Zakari is a maker, he's a photographer, he's a poet, and now he's a sixth grader. Anyway, you need to trust me when I tell you Zakari is all these things. Or, quite frankly, you could trust Zakari when he tells you he's those things. A year ago, he and his classmates designed this book of poems and photographs. But I'm going to ask you to help me do something, if you will. Are you, you up to a little bit of uh, audience participation? Sure. Anyone? Great. So I'm going to ask you to help me read Zakari's poem, if you would. Let's start at the beginning and do it together. It's always better together. I can hear my friends playing outside. The noises of the cars. I see the tree blossoms right outside my window. The bees are pollinating the flowers. I smell the sweet air made by the trees. I see the leaves beginning to come back to green of summer and put away the brown of fall. I am a brown boy with white shoes and green shirt, a sunny smile. Just like a good Lutheran choir here, folks, Zakari. (laughs) Zakari is all four seasons. I was invited to share with Zakari school, as I often am, tools and stories and frameworks and ways of making it. As often happens, I was also invited to learn. When Zakari saw the network map, he knew instinctively what it meant. And he wasn't thinking about being the average of five people because Zakari knows he's royalty. He knows he's not average. He listened intently as I explained the theories behind social networks and community to his teachers. And when he was called upon, he didn't have a need for any of the theory because he knew the story. He knew the poetry. Here was the explanation he offered. Well, these dots... These dots in this little lump here, they know each other well. They're talking and dancing and having a great time. And these dots over here on the other end that are disconnected, they don't know as many people. And they're quiet. And they might just be a little lonely. But if we can get these dots to know these dots, to share their stories, then everyone will be well. So profound from a then fifth grader, now sixth grader, so simple that I have thought of it almost every day since then. Just a couple weeks ago, I was sitting alone on an airplane. I started crying, which is not a great idea to do on an airplane. (laughs) Thinking about Gerald and Zakari, I was trying so hard to find an answer to how to change the world, possibly an answer that Zakari had had since the start. The answer of how these dots, these people really, can acknowledge and connect with these dots, share their stories. They'd understand each other a little bit better, and maybe then everyone would be well. Maybe Zakari would be well. Maybe Gerald would still be well. But what was Zakari doing? He hadn't set out to change the world. He was doing the work of a designer. He was designing community. Because did I mention Zakari and the Kings are designers, capital D. I was brought to the Kings community to teach, but I had so much more to learn. Human beings are wired for curiosity of this sort. They don't do so merely by asking the big questions of heaven and creation and how they get jelly inside of donuts, but also the smallest questions. Why? 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 Children are so good at this. And another one that I ask myself frequently, what matters most? What matters most in my life and in my work with my wife and children standing here with you tonight? We also know that humans are wired to connect. They do so with their stories, but stories require both a teller and a listener. 
This story would be nothing without you here tonight. Without that connection, creativity can't occur. Human beings are wired to live in community. They do so through shared values and aspiration. But my goodness, does it take a level of vulnerability? At least three of us were dry heaving in the bathroom before this to get up in front of you, to decide what we stand for, to decide what we'd sacrifice for. Just one last thought. And I fear this will either resonate deeply or or not at all. But the thing that matters more when designing community than the relationships of influence we cultivate, the stories we share, are those stories we tell ourselves. These are the stories that carry our fears, our insecurities, our versions sometimes truly distorted of the truth. They carry our biases, our prejudices, our history. Often before we even get to the point of thinking about changing the world or designing community or even connecting with another person, the stories we've already told ourselves have limited that possibility. Now, I want to be clear, and this is pretty important. You get to choose, leaving tonight, you get to choose whether your story includes Zakari, the Kings, Mr. P, and Gerald. I think we've come to believe that when we see disconnection, that it's a breakdown of the system, that it's a breakdown of design. But as we acknowledge in the beginning that this land we meet on has a longer, deeper truth, I think we also need to acknowledge that sometimes disconnection is by design. It's part of the design. Ward 8, where Mr. P and Zakari get up every morning and go to school, has one grocery store for 78,000 people. Three-fourths of the men that would have once called themselves kings end up involved in the criminal justice system, and 80% of kids like Gerald are sent to special ed right out of the gate because the system doesn't understand how to deal with young black men like them. A final hint of the intended design and the intentions behind all of this is that this year in the mayor of D.C.'s budget, This year in the mayor of D.C.'s budget, there was more money budgeted for parking lots than after-school programs. We may not have designed these systems and communities ourselves. We may not have been there at the time, but I do believe we have a responsibility to redesign them. You see, I I don't leave you dwelling on the fact that uh, Gerald was killed or believing that Southeast D.C. is a place where that should be pitied or a place where hope goes to die. Those aren't stories about you. They're not my story either. These are not truths that will stick with you if you you hear it that way. I want you to leave here knowing that Gerald lived and was allowed to die, disconnected at a time when we are more connected than we've ever been. It's not comfortable or simple or easy, but it is transformational. Our personal stories start, and sometimes they end way sooner than we would hope. And we all have something at stake because of the way that we are intertwined. And stories like Gerald's, it's easy to talk about some faraway place like D.C. that looks and acts differently than we do here. But stories like Gerald happen everywhere, including our community. Now, I don't want to discourage you either. I want you to leave feel empowered, but empowered to tell a fuller, truer story, to dream about a bolder, bigger community, and to ask important questions. If connection is how we are made well as a community, and if the world around us is built for disconnection and division, How do we make the life-giving connections between us and others that we'll never meet? Can our curiosity lead to wisdom crafted in stories that ensure connection? Can we create spaces for experiences that build communities of values driving towards significance, not only for us, but for all of us? We can't design community in isolation. We can't find our sense of well-being or make the world well without dismantling the systems that are optimized for disconnection. When you spend enough time listening to the rhythms and stories of others, you start to really hear them. And you realize there are only variants of your own. The words may be different and the rhythms diverse, but the song and the poems written by Zakari and spoken by you tonight of ROI networks and and maps of community, the stories of connection and curiosity, the creativity and making is all the same. These things take in time. They take intention. They require listening. To change yourself, you must change your habits. And to change your habits, you need to change your stories. And changing stories connected to others may just be how we change the world. I don't have the answers to that. But what I know is that today, when I was in full-scale panic mode about sharing this with you, I had the opportunity to talk to Mr. P on the phone. We talked about the kings and how they're designing spaces around relationships of influence. Some of the tools I shared with them that they have long ago made their own. They went to Harvard recently. They went to Harvard to share their theories of design, their work, their stories, their relationships. They, the kings, remember, fifth graders, are designing good services, spaces and conversations within their community to see each other, to hear each other's stories, to create a bigger sense of purpose, 
to address community-wide challenges relating to their education, their physical health, the threat of gun violence on a daily basis, and a broader version of well-being. Soon they'll be hosting their own version of TED-style talks, healing circles, and what they call a community reunion, so that they and those connected to them can heal and redesign their community and community well-being together. Now, we may not be kings, but we can aspire to be. We can focus on our humanity, be vulnerable with sharing our stories, sometimes imperfect. We can take steps past sympathy, beyond empathy, to actual curiosity about others, hearing them and their stories, getting to know them, discovering each other beyond our differences. With proper consent, we can give high fives and hugs and hold hands and celebrate our uniqueness and our togetherness. Sometimes the best thing we can do as human beings, if we want to change the world, if we want to design better communities, is to remind ourselves that we are not alone in this, that our stories matter, that I belong, that you belong, that we belong, and that if we sit for a bit on a night like this and find a place with the discomfort of our collective curiosities, creating a space for community and connection, we might just design a life and a work and a community that is so much bigger and bolder and beautiful, more beautiful than we ever dreamed. Thank you.